why, quantum, why biology needs quantum mechanics? And as a biologist, that's the question that's uh, uh, motivated me in my uh, biological career, why I came into biology. What's the difference between all of this stuff and all of that stuff, the inert stuff? And it seems that there's an incredible difference. And what I'm going to do is look at how we got to quantum biology. Uh, of course, first, the difference between the inert stuff and the living stuff was put down to vitalism, vital spirits in the living souls. And uh, that idea, thankfully, um, had its demise in the 19th century. <coughs> but still, there was kind of uncertainty as whether the science that was emerging in the late 19th century was capable of accounting for life. So a lot of people spent a lot of time trying to define life. <clears throat> and it's worthwhile thinking about how they did it. Uh, uh, thermodynamics was certainly a part of life, and we're all happy with thermodynamics being involved in life. Self-organization, the kind of things that happens in tornadoes and, uh, um, and uh, the red spot of Jupiter, etc. <clears throat> Crystals, self-organized. Self-replication, whether that was... Uh, the key characteristic of life, but as you probably know, not all living cells are red cells, don't divide, but they're still alive. Um, Buddhist monks don't divide, don't replicate, supposedly, neither do Catholic priests, supposedly, but they're still living. So, um, and computer viruses replicate pretty darn well without being alive. Heredity, well, crystals uh, exhibit heredity, various other structures do exhibit heredity, sensitivity, well, a thermostat does. Uh, smart materials do. Information processing, a lot of people say that life is really about information processing, which it certainly is, as everything else in the universe is as well. Information processing can be written into every single process that we know about in the universe, obviously computers being one of them. Electricity, ah, oh, that's from my another talk I was giving at another meeting. So, but, okay, so at the end of the 19th century, although vitalism was in retreat, it wasn't quite gone. And s many uh, scientists, for instance, this guy, Ludwig van Velt uh, Lefley, he came up with the idea that um, biology, he, he said that biology was stagnating. It needed new ideas, new principles to describe life. And he really founded the, um, the first phase of quantum biology, which came out of interest in two areas, really, or two different approaches to quantum biology. So one reason for what quantum biology became interesting was it was doing so well in physics. Um, quantum mechanics was doing so well in physics. But the other was the rise of the organists, organicists, who... Um, really were a, a reaction against the two schools of thought popular in biology, reductionism and vitalism. And what the organicists who grew up in the 20th, early 20th century came to do was to claim that there was something between these two approaches, that life had some principle that had yet to be discovered in physics, some new principle. And of course, the quantum physicists has said, we already discovered it. It's quantum mechanics, of course. Um, but that was also inspired some, some great fundamental work by some of the early biochemists who did all of these uh, uh, fantastic breakthrough, um, uh, breakthroughs in the early 20th century, which led scientists such as Niels Bohr to become interested in quantum mechanics, uh, quantum, the idea that quantum mechanics may be behind biology. So it's worthwhile. Um, Niels Bohr never said anything very clearly, actually, in my, my <laughs> reading of this. It's always, he, he talks about, uh, uh, about complementarity and the measurement problem, but his, his writing has the measurement problem. You can't really get the sense out of it one way or another. So on the one hand, <laughs> Darwinism states that the process of heredity uh, well, you can read it as well as I, but, it, but the one that he was uh, querying is the second assertion that new forms originate through purely accidental disturbances of gene structure. And he took that, he was questioning whether 
uh, accidental disturbances of gene structure were responsible for mutation because he thought measurement might be in there. Um, and he thought that you needed quantum mechanics to bridge the gulf between the living and the inanimate. So he was interested in the role of measurements, and one of the, it, it had both a positive and negative role in his thoughts. One was he thought that biologists wouldn't be able to investigate living structures without disturbing them because of the uncertainty principle, but he also thought that measurement may be involved in living uh, organisms. But he wasn't the first to write the first paper on quantum mechanics. That was this guy, Pascal Jordan. Um, he wrote this first paper on quantum biology in 1932. Uh, famous quantum physicist, of course, uh, quantum mechanics and the fundamental problems of biology and psychology, claiming that quantum mechanics was fundamental to life. And his reasoning is very strange and interesting. I'll give you a moment to read that if you can. I hope it's, uh, but have a, have a read of it. It makes a very interesting <laughs> reading, I think. For a moment, I won't read it out to you. It's too, too lengthy. But you'll start to get the, you'll be starting to get the sense of it now. Essentially, he was saying that genes in living organisms play the same role in life as the Führer plays in Nazi Germany. He saw genes as the dictators of living cells. And because he reckoned the genes were small and molecular entities, he said that that dictatorship would take place at a quantum level. Um, so that was his uh, contribution. Very, very interesting, but it does, uh, it's scary and interesting at the same time. Um, he was a Nazi. So that's, that was one of the reasons, maybe, maybe not a big reason, but one of the reasons why quantum biology fell into, into uh, abeyance after the war, really, uh, because its chief spokesman was a Nazi, and he kind of brought it into his Nazi ideology. But this is the guy we generally associate with the beginnings of quantum biology, who has a lot, uh, a cleaner past. He fled uh, Nazi Germany to live in Ireland, and um, he was already while he was in Germany thinking about biology, this is a notebook for talking, you can see he's, he's drawing genes and, and chromosomes and trying to work out how they work. And then famously he wrote this book in 1944, influenced by uh, work of Delbrock and others on target theory, how radiation interacts with living with hereditary material. Um, and, uh, and he proposed that um, uh, that life and quantum, quantum mechanics was fundamental to life. And it's interesting to look at his arguments, because I think it's still relevant today. So he, he claimed that, well, he, he stated that behind all the physical laws that we know about, the laws of thermodynamics, the gas laws, every, every law is actually statistical mechanics. And that at a molecular level, there was disorder and that the laws that you see and the order that you see in structures like storms, etc., cetera, um, <coughs> is actually order at a macroscopic level, but at a microscopic level, it's disorder, it's chaos. So we call this order from disorder. And that, of course, is still that order that you get from disorder can be harnessed, as it is in steam trains, and as most people thought it was in life at the time that that really was the principle of life. It was order harnessing these statistical mechanical laws, essentially, to drive living technology. So he claimed, and he was particularly interested in heredity, you remember he was drawing those chromosomes, um, that living organism seems to be a macroscopic system which in part of its behavior approaches me purely mechanical, to which all systems tend as the temperature approaches absolute zero and molecular Disorder is removed. In other words, quantum mechanical behavior. And he claimed that genes were some kind of crystal, a aperiodic crystal in which the individual crystal structures play a coding role. So he claimed that 
uh, as most structures in the inanimate world are order from chaos, order from disorder, but life uniquely has order all the way down. And I think that's still relevant to how we understand quantum biology today, that life is rooted in a molecular kind of level. So these were the key insights of the, of the uh, quantum biology pioneers. That still, I think, is an is a important insight, amplification. So Jordan's recognition that living cells depend on very few molecules that have a dictatorial influence on the cell, and because they're very few, they have quantum mechanical aspects, but life amplifies them to the macroscopic level. That was really Jordan who first came up with that. Bohr was looking at complementarity in the role of measurement and Schrodinger the order from order idea. But, <coughs> so those were insights, but then they kind of were forgotten about mostly. I mean, uh, um, although they were influential, most people didn't believe in them. But, um, because they knew that quantum weirdness is usually very delicate. They're all the very interesting quantum phenomena that we're interested in in quantum biology, like coherence, entanglement, tunneling, etc., are very delicate phenomena. And you can see wave and quantum mechanics is, of course, wave-like phenomena. Um, uh, taking place with particles. And you can see waves in a still pond if you throw pebbles in that pond, but try, try throwing pedals, pebbles in that pond and you won't see wave-like behavior. And this is the argument that people used to dismiss quantum biology in the early years, that life is much more like this and it's very unlikely to exhibit phenomena such as this. Now, this would have been a movie, and I don't think it's going to work here. No, it's not going to work. Anyway, this, you have to imagine, this is a, a, an animation of a living cell, and you have to imagine all of those, all those uh, molecules there vibrating like mad. And that's what it would be if it was animated. But uh, you have to imagine that. And then that is the argument, really, that really quantum mechanical stuff really can survive. So by and large, when molecular biology became the dominant ethos in biology, it forgot about Schrodinger's claim about quantum mechanics. And it did just fine without it. All of the great advances in molecular biology were done with ball and stick molecules, or models of molecules. So it all went fine. Uh, but we now uh, have uh, quantum biology that appeared at the, um, uh, that's the earliest stuff that I was looking, that I was talking about. And then in the 1970s, um, uh, uh, Default and Chance div uh, showed that electron tunneling can take place in en enzymes. And we're going to hear much more about all of this stuff here from the other speakers um, today and tomorrow. So I won't really be going into all of the interesting areas of quantum, quantum biology, which uh, you see here and illustrated here. So I'm going to just, in the last, I've got 10 minutes, I think, uh, last 10 minutes, talk about our own interests. Um, so actually, that's um, pointing out that amplification from quantum to classical realm and order from disorder are really involved in all of these areas here. Uh, quantum mutation, the one that myself and Jim Al-Khalili are interested in, is more to do with quantum measurement, although it involves these and, of course, consciousness. We're going to hear from Roger Penrose about also um, is uh, based on um, measurement. So first of all, where's Guildford? It's just south of London. That's where the University of Surrey is, where um, Jim Al-Khalili and I work and have been doing so in quantum, um, interested in quantum biology since this paper in 1988, The Origin of Mutants, uh, written by John Cairns, a very eminent molecular biologist, uh, worked with uh, uh, Watson and Crick at MIT, and this paper is from Harvard. And he published this paper in 1988, claiming that mutations would occur more readily at a higher frequency if they provided an advantage to the cell. That was heresy in neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory. So it was a big deal, this, uh, um, this um, paper. It generated a storm of letters in um, Nature and other journals trying to work out what could be going on because it clearly came from a sound experimentalist 
other scientists reproduced the experiments, but something fishy was going on, and um, I wondered whether it was quantum mechanics, and um, because actually just at the time I read John Gribbin's Schrodinger's Cat, which is an excellent book about quantum mechanics, and I learned about Schrodinger's work, who proposed that one of his other proposals was that um, mutations were quantum mechanical, some representing some kind of quantum jump, that um, in DNA molecules, and now we know, of course, that his insight that, that genes were some kind of um, aperiodic crystal pretty much describes the DNA double helix in which individual atoms and particles play a role. These are the protons in the, um, uh, in the hydrogen bonds of a base pair. And the position of these protons is essentially the genetic code. And this was first pointed out, really, by this guy, another physicist, Pierre L.F. Lodin. He pointed out that the DNA code is essentially a quantum code written in proton positions, and that mutations may take place through proton tunneling. So there might be, so this is a normal canonical Watson and Crick base pair, but if this proton attached to this atom pops over here and this one pops over there, then you'll get the tautomeric form of the base. And in these tautomeric forms, this is the normal AT base pair. If adenine is in, it, in its rare tautomeric amino form, it can pair with cytosine rather than thymine and cause a mutation. So Lodin proposed that that may be a cause of mutation. So I went to the physics department at Surrey, gave a talk there on this. It was very skeptically received, but Jim Alkali was in the audience, and together we worked out over, over many uh, meetings some kind of idea about, to be honest, it's not much point in going through it because we don't really hold to it these days, but essentially we were making the case that this transition from the normal to the tautomeric form may be influenced by the cellular environment that may produce some kind of quantum measurement, so relying on Bohr's kind of ideas about quantum measurements, producing something like an inverse Zeno effect to fix the mutation. It was very hand wavy. Yes? What I'd have to look that up. I don't have it in my head, but I can tell you. Tell you I, I, and I'll tell you more about it. So anyway, I went on to publish this book about quantum mechanics in biology in 2000. Um, and then the area that inspired us, adaptive mutations, as they were called, this stuff here, got kind of messy. It was discovered that lots of other things were going on in those cells, and the calculation of the mutation rates was difficult. So we decided to return to a simpler question of investigating whether tunneling itself plays a role in mutation. And Jim Alkalili did use density function theory to calculate tunneling rates, and he would have in this paper uh, the energy barrier for that. Um, and he looked at whether uh, tunneling from one uh, well to another takes place over the top, classically, or whether it takes place by tunneling. And the answer he got is that if it takes place at all, his calculations suggested it takes place through thermally assisted tunneling, and that's the paper that my own work went, I'm an experimentalist, so we looked at whether we could perturb mutation by replacing hydrogen with deuterium. Deuterium, twice the mass, of course, the proton ought to tunnel less. So we grew E. coli in normal and deuterated water, counted mutants, and these are the blue spots there, and when we did that, when we, we found that the uh, deuterium reduced the mutation rate, but there's a lot of big error bars as there are in most biology experiments. And there's lots going on in cells. We can't really say that that's due to the DNA. Um, more recently, we've done it in vitro using the polymerase chain reaction, just replicating DNA in a test tube, essentially. And we get a similar reduction in mutation rate. Uh, with D2O. So does tunneling cause mutation? Maybe. 
there still needs a lot to be done to show that this is due to uh, um, tunneling. Okay, I've got a couple more minutes. So, <clears throat> has quantum biology really dawned? These are the issues I think that we have. Not enough uh, models. Theory and experimentation are often going on independently. Reproducibility. Where is the classical quantum bio, uh, boundary and skill base? Um, but I'm going to look at one of them first. This is essentially illustrating coherence in a physics experiment over time. Something will remain coherent. This is what happens in the real world, in the inanimate world. Particles intervene, random motion intervenes, and systems become incoherent. <clears throat> this is what was thought about biology. It's taking place here. And that's why biology was not thought to involve quantum mechanics, because it's taking place after the random motion has intervened. This is what we're arguing about over the next couple of days, that some of it may be taking place here before uh, decoherence has kicked in, or that maybe in biological systems, the noise is modified in some way, the, uh, that it doesn't decohere the system as efficiently it, as it does in inanimate systems. So that's the kind of things, issues that I think we need to explore. Uh, we need a skill base. Uh, fortunately, as uh, Greg mentioned, we have a doctoral training center just established at the University of Surrey in quantum biology. Uh, we have five years funding for 21 PhD students. Uh, the first year's intake of 12 students has just started. We've got a lot of projects going on already, eight different projects going on in a lot of different areas of quantum biology. This is the team at the moment. There's Jim, there's me, and there's uh, our students. And uh, we would very much like to collaborate with anyone who would be interested in collaborating on quantum biology. Thank you very much. John Joe. Jim's the other one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pasquale Jordan. Uh, Jordan um, joined the Nazi party in 36 together with another 8 million people. And yeah. he was such a bad Nazi, he did not have a career during the war at all. Okay. And he spent the entire war trying to convince Albert Speer to create an institute of quantum biology, okay. which must have been quite low on Speer's uh, <laughs> list of priorities, yeah, yeah. I imagine. And after the war, he got completely a clean record from his Jewish physicist friends and became okay. professor at Hamburg. Yeah. And Germany is littered with squares named after, Albert, you know, uh, von Karajan, for example, Herbert von Karajan, the conductor, who was far more of a Nazi than, mm. um, than Jordan. Jordan. So okay. I don't think it's fair. Okay. Uh, he was a conservative right-winger who preferred, uh, wrongly, uh, Hitler to communism, but he was not an active Nazi in any way. Okay. quantum mechanics on the mutations. That's a very rare event that you're measuring, yeah. right? So the question is, how much the isotope difference compared to regular fluctuations you have on the experiment? Can you actually yeah, be yeah. certain that this is really an isotope effect versus? Not, not at the moment. Uh, uh, we have to do a lot more experiments. I mean, you can always deal with noise in biological systems just by doing experiments a lot of times. Uh, so, you know, you, can, you may have to replicate something a hundred times to be able to get the error bars down to a level which you can be comfortable with. But it is possible to yeah. extract subtle effects as long as you have a big enough samples. It would be interesting to see if there is another clever way of doing it, because these are very rare events. That means a hundred is not enough. You're going to have to do more experiments than that. Maybe there's another... I was thinking about it. It's yeah, very yeah. interesting. If you, if you come up with a good <laughs> uh, another idea, then I would be pleased to hear it. A few comments. Uh, first, because of the very low energy barrier between the tautomers, it became particularly important as they started to get X-ray structures of nucleic acids. Often people would put them in the standard state and the things would fall apart because they were actually in the tautomer state. Mm -hmm. and, and that was because they couldn't, the, and the X-ray structures couldn't you know, detect, the, see the, the protons. And the other thing is, in your studies, you know, like for years of working with Carl Vos, he says, oh, Zan, they're not four bases. There's a hundred of them. Because he talked about all the possible mutations and just not the ones that could come about through tunneling, as you showed. 
particularly in RNA, without those, you wouldn't stabilize the ribosomal uh, uh, RNA and also some of the mutations that are in, in DNA. So I would hope that you guys would, you know, uh, look further than just uh, those ones that you presented Abs because they absolutely. are critical for the stability of many yeah, of these yeah. biomolecules. A absolutely. There's no question there are many other causes of mutation, radiation, heat, um, uh, chemical mutagens, all of these cause mutations. So we have to zero in on what we can easily measure and the one that we think we might be able to measure a quantum mechanical effect in. But they're all involve molecular uh, level interactions that may well involve quantum mechanics, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> just a comment and, and then a question. So uh, from enzymes, we're finding that you need noise to get coherence. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. That it's, and the, that it's the noise in the vibrational modes and yeah. various conformational substates mm. that generate the needed coherence. It's probably true in electron tunneling as well. Yeah, and, and so in I think as well. it's a it's a different way of well. of framing what's going on. Yeah. <coughs> in, yeah. In terms of the DNA, that gets to another question. <coughs> Excuse <coughs> me. It's the cold that's going around, but. Hopefully I'm not contagious. Well, we hope anymore. it's not going around today. I promise. <laughs> okay, so the thing is that <coughs> we're talking about thermodynamics versus kinetics. Tunneling is basically a kinetic issue. When we look at the tautomers in DNA, they're uh, thermodynamically in equilibrium. And the question is whether tunneling is going to alter that thermodynamic yeah, equilibrium. Absolutely. It's, it's the, the tunneling lifetime versus the lifetime of the actual transcription or replication of the DNA. Yeah. And then you have yeah. to think about single-stranded DNA because that's mm. how replication and transcription yeah, take place. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna, I have one slide on this. I've been thinking about it long and hard. I don't know, but it's, it's something we should pursue more here. Yeah, so um, <coughs> I, I wanna go back to the, actually to the energy. Um, so I heard here that this turning barrier is about 5 kT. Um, if this is true, actually, first of all, this is not an equilibrium system. So tunneling is very much more complicated in non-equilibrium systems than equilibrium yeah, because you have all the time ATP releasing energy. Yeah. And the ATP energy that's released is about 5 kT. Mm. So this is not noise. The noise is much lower. The noise is kT. If this yeah. is 5 kT, you can calculate very on the back of the envelope uh, what is the tunneling rate. But this is a non-equilibrium system, so I just wonder, um, I mean, usually in biology, mutations are associated with ROS, with uh, reactive oxygen species. Yeah. But in fact, if really all the ATP release of energy inside the cell uh, is, is assisting this kind of mutations, it could be very highly probable. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I I'm just wondering about that statement that advantageous mutations might be more frequent than other ones. Mm. Uh, did I get that right? That and was the claim. That's w that was the claim of what they were called at the time adaptive mutations. Yeah. I would say that at the moment that is not believed. That there are thought to be other explanations of John Cairns' experiments. It's not that they've disproved that adaptive mutations uh, t can take place, but um, they don't think that it's necessarily the explanation of his experiments. Okay, thank you. While we work our uh, technical issues, sorry, we have one more question. Yeah, I guess it's a, an almost a subtle question connecting the first part of your talk to the last part. I mean, if I'm a card carrying biologist or evolutionary biologist in this case, I would say, okay, the rate of mutation, if I want to calculate it, might depend on, let's say, proton tunneling. Let's say I use that statistically. Yeah. But after all, it's just a rate. So I take that rate as experimental for someone else's calculation. Then I go shove it in as a standard classical of evolution and selection or whatever, and I don't see any of this quantum biology, quantum measurement somehow affecting life or whatever. It's just at the molecular scale. I have a rate that may be quantum mm -hmm. mechanical in origin. Yeah. It's interesting. I may want to calculate that, but that's not the same thing as what all these people were somehow postulating, that there's some magical quantumness to life. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, can you comment on uh, that? No, uh, remember that our inspiration for getting into this was to explain adaptive mutations when people still thought that adaptive mutations were a real phenomenon. Well, 
it's now, it's, it hasn't been disproved, and many people still think that it may be going on, but um, it's, harder to, uh, it's harder to measure. And it ha they have also been proposed in, in mutations leading to cancer, that the mutations seem to be occurring at a higher rate than you would expect. So, yes, I agree. Yeah. Uh, who have argued that the notion that the rate of mutation and even maybe you know, the general vicinity of which part of the genome is mutating, the idea that that's completely random and things is not true. Mm. And there's evidence from her work, for example, that yeah. the actual biological signaling networks that control yeah. what the rate of mutation might be, which parts of the genome might be more amenable to mutation. But that's yeah. a far cry from saying, we know we need to fix the enzymes of some particular sugar. Yeah. And no, I, I, I agree. We are not holding to that anymore. We are interested in whether quantum tunneling may be involved because then something like quantum measurement pl may play a role somehow in the mutation rate, <laughs> perhaps. We're not sure, but we're just wanting to pin down the question that Schrodinger put forward all those years ago that whether mutations may be some kind of quantum jump. Well, we're working on technical issues. Maybe we have another question. Um, it's, it's not a question. It's a, uh, the, uh, Eric Kuhl at Rochester in, 19, in, the, in the 1980s showed that DNA without any hydrogen bonds, uh, special bases made to not have hydrogen bonds, replicated very reasonably faithfully and, and in fact was glued together by repulsive interactions. Uh, uh, I'd so like to see that so paper, actually. Right? It does sound bizarre. Uh, it's actually a be beautiful paper. Okay. Uh, so I'm curious to see what his mutation rate was <laughs> compared <laughs> to yours, because he has exactly zero hydrogen bonds yeah, in the yeah. entire DNA molecule. Yeah, yeah. And remember, the other thing about mutation, I'm sure your uh, colleague here will know as well, is that measuring mutation rates, you're measuring, actually mostly you're measuring the error correction machinery, how efficiently that's working, because actually the mutation rate is a lot higher uh, in, the, in replication of DNA than you get mutation rate. And that's because errors are are being removed all the time. So it's complicated to try to pin down right. what part of the mutation rate you measure is coming from error correction deficiencies or what part is coming from the original but, mutation. But John Joe, you're also changing the PK of every single proteinatable group. Absolutely, in, in absolutely. But uh, at least in the in vitro experiment, we're just uh, dealing with DNA polymerase. And we can try to, well, there are ways that we can try to pin it down if the effect holds. Uh, yeah, sure. In your detour, in, in your detour experiment it, on the uh, y-axis, was it cell growth or mutational rate? Did you actually mutation rate? And how did you measure mutational? Uh, well, no, it was mutational frequency, really, rather than mutational rate. So we're counting, uh, we're counting the number <coughs> of uh, mutants divided by the number of cells. Number of mutants being determined by? by well, it was a, we were using B galactosidase. Oh, PCR? Um, well, yes, it w in the in vitro experiments, we were amplifying DNA and then transforming it into cell and looking for blue and white colonies. Okay, fair enough, thank you. <laughs>